Sunny Players! This is the Dominion League Weekly Podcast! I am your host Strumpf and this is the episode for May 12, 2023. It's the last couple days of season 57. Let's take a look at things. Fika remains at the top of A Division. Mick is waiting in second place to see how the first four positions will shake out between himself, Fika, Triple Range Merge, and VR Smith. I think every championship match pairing is still possible among those four, and we will just have to wait and see how Fika's match against VR Smith will go on Sunday. Yurika Mama and Janeos will sadly demote to B, and Haka 3 will safely return to his third season in A tier in June. Negative wins B1 with a 70% win rate and returns to A division after a four season absence. Congrats! Tracer sits in a very comfortable first place in B2 with 67% and waits for the rest of his division to wrap up. Burning Skull is at the top of C1 and looking to solidify this position in his last remaining match of the season. Same goes for Dr. Steelhammer in C2 and for Shad in C3. And Bobby DJ18 wins C4. Congratulations! Derpa held out in number one of D1 and will make his comeback to C tier after nine seasons. Congrats! The second promoting spot in that division is still up for grabs between Navis Awesome, Spiraler, and Chimera. Zombie. <laughs> this is so. <laughs> Zombie was not zombie. <laughs> Ah, uh, goddammit, autocorrect. Zimobi and ZW Lemon are in first and second place in D2, but a couple matches are still open in that division. Similarly, in D3, Gamesu and Scumpy are the current number one and two, with a couple open matches still. Kubu wins D4 and promotes to C for the first time in his league career. Congrats! As of now, Will Wong is in second place, but Taipa Europea might still edge past them. Chappie82 remains in first position of E1, as does Putya in E2 with 71% wins in 4. First time league player Eskin wins E3 with 72% wins. Congrats! Eskoglund wins E4 and returns to D for the first time since season 38. Congratulations! Cat Stealer419 wins E5. Congratulations to you as well! Now, Amethet 11 and Willpower 264 are tied in number one of E6 and will have to play a tiebreaker for the win. They both won 73% of their games this season. Very impressive. Sporting Elijah wins E7 with 77%. Congrats! And A Libby remains in the lead of E8 with one last match to go. Y'all, I didn't collect any results comments um so i have none to shout out and i think that's entirely on all of you <coughs> size games have started but are coming in slow um the player count has gone down significantly these past couple installments which might have to do with the move to a separate server small games are split into groups newt and mustang Newt is my group, so it's the better group. As of now, one match was played, and I think right now the Newts are playing a match. We have seven medium games players this installment. Iguanoid and Ginger Bowtie are leading the way with a 75% win rate each. And we have five big games players with no results to report as of now. The Hinterlands 2 Emix group phase is underway. Shout out to Farmlands group, who is almost done already. Very busy group. Um, w. Morrison, Derpa, and Snowbizzy have played all their matches. Well done. And the German League Top 5 has seen a little bit of change since last we spoke. Jens shouldered past RTT to fifth spot. 
Two Dovman and Negative remain in fourth and third position respectively. And Snicker 97 edged past you Exodus to the very top by one tiny single little point. <laughs> I decided to return to League next season, and I'm telling you here so I don't back out again. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm looking forward to my big games matches and League and everything. Yay! And with this, we have reached the preview. Today, at 22 UTC, Spiraler will play Chimera for D1. At 1 UTC tomorrow, that is Saturday, Furco will play Kazumaru OA28 for B2. At 4 UTC, Mazatov will play Gamesu for D3. That's such a busy day tomorrow. W. Morrison will play Apostolosa Ruler for League C at 5 UTC. At 13 UTC, Taipa Europea will play AJL828 for D. And at 15 UTC, Lucas 567 will play Bambuglo for League D. On Sunday, <gasps> Derpa and I will play our biggest match. Ah! Um, at 17 UTC, I already told you about this, uh, Fika will play VR Smith to the final match in A, and that will determine the championship match. So tune in, everyone. And at the same time, Cyrus will play Burning Skull for League C. And that's those are all the exciting games that are taking place this weekend. I know I haven't done this in a while, but insect update. There was a bug on my parasol. It was really big and I could fly. I'm very upset. And with this, we have reached Spec Chat, where I'll share thoughts on any given piece of media I've consumed over the week that is strictly non Dominion related. Um, this is not so much media, but anyway, uh, today I discovered that a new dress that I bought secondhand last week has pockets! Such joy! Patriarchy is a dick in general, but the fact that dresses and skirts just don't typically come with pockets is incredibly annoying. So whenever you happen upon one that does, it is a little miracle and it deserves a shout out. Also, a friend showed me a ginormous secondhand store in Kreuzberg this week <laughs> that I never knew existed. And it is glorious, but also just too big. We were thoroughly overwhelmed by the sheer mass of things. They had decorative boxes filled with chucks from top to bottom in all the colors of the rainbow and more. They had a pretty decent man section as well, which not every second hand shop has. They had a lot of old-timey decorum, a, a couple of typewriters and such. Um, yeah, to be honest, sometimes it wasn't quite clear what items were up for sale and what was just decoration. So usually you get two types of secondhand stores, either everything has a price tag or you pay by weight. And this one had a mix of both where they had six different price segments that you paid by weight. In any case, I don't really like to buy more clothes than I need or just in general, I don't really like to buy more than I need. And I, yeah, I had just been shopping the weekend before and was way too overwhelmed by everything, so I didn't get anything, but I'll definitely be back and I will share a link in the show notes. Um, oh, apparently, I just looked this up um, to share the link. <laughs> apparently, they have four stores in Berlin and they have shops in Hamburg, München and London too. <laughs> Amazing! Buy your clothes secondhand, everyone, except, you know, underwear and socks. And now I've got a little snippet from my conversation with Donald X for the advent calendar for you that didn't make it into the doors. This is from our discussion of Scrying Pool. And there you have it, Scrying Pool. 
Amazing. This one has way more story, even though it's just five little images. I have questions, but I don't know if... Uh... That's okay. So you said you were more sympathetic to the fortune teller version of this. Could you say more about that? Because I feel like Scrying Pool is an excellent card. Like I see, I see your reasoning with it's just IRL. It's yeah. I mean, it's all about the how slow the card is. It's a real issue that uh, you know can make games bad for players if if cards are too slow to resolve. Oracle was an extreme case of this, and I replaced it. Uh, you know, Scrying Pool is really over the top. The, the, that observatory is slow because we have to sit there while you reveal all those cards and you're going to do this over and over. And it's way slower than mm. like draw five cards. You just put them in your hand and then consider what you're going to do next. Instead, we have to do it one at a time. Uh, and that doesn't, that doesn't just kill those ideas necessarily. And there are some, you know, like recently there's like Hunter and allies, right? Where, we reveal three cards and then process what's going on and you may have to make a decision. And so that can make it slower to like draw your deck with hunters. Uh, so it didn't kill that. Right. But it is slow. It is something to worry about and, you know, conceivably kill based on just how it plays out. And so then on top of this slow card, I added this spy effect and spy is extremely slow and <laughs> it's not, very good as an attack it's uh it's it's close to worthless i mean it you can have games where it's like oh this was cool because i i wait i scried until you got a good card on top so i could hit it with my barbarian or something uh but uh in general it's really wasting our time and again you know people play this game in real life not just online and they play multiplayer And there's four players and you play scrying pool and you need to make four decisions as to who leaves what on top. And for yourself, it's trivial because you just leave the action on top because you'll draw it anyway and uh, otherwise discard it because you sure want to draw lots of actions. Once in a while, it's like, oh, maybe I'm done drawing for the turn and I leave this potion on top or whatever. But, uh, but for all the other players, it's something you have to think about until they get to a dead card and you're just going to leave that on top. So yeah, it's just uh, it's just too slow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you would you would probably know much more about it. It's just for me, like the the beauty of the game is that there are infinite possible combinations, and and sometimes you hit gold with scrying pool. We can get those combinations without having this. It's it's a thing. It's that That's true. we don't need any particular card in Dominion. <laughs> no. You know, you don't. Any particular card, it would it wouldn't be that there was just a, a scrying pool shaped hole in the game. There would just be whatever other card. Um <laughs> well, and in we this definitely case, need goons. I would have been super happy to do that observatory. It's a cool card. <laughs> it's very strong. Uh it's way faster. It, it's just a delight. And uh, yeah, observatory yeah. would have been way better than scrying pool. But you were asking specifically about the fortune teller thing. And so the the whole idea to the fortune teller. And there it is on Fortune Teller itself, is to not have to make the decision for the other players because that yeah, would beat it. Yeah. So again, we're playing a four player game and you play Fortune Teller and everyone just does it to themselves while you continue with your turn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that makes sense. And mm -hmm. it's still not great. And the ideal form of Fortune Teller is Relic, which is just instant. <laughs> Um, everyone has a bad card on top. In fact, it's so bad, it's no card at all. And we're done. <laughs> But I still prefer the fortune teller approach to the spy approach. You know, spy seems like this cool thing to do. And it's just not like if it were if it were more powerful, if it were good enough, then I could see doing it on the grounds that, you know, I mean, I would charge for it and you wouldn't be doing it as often. And we'd be getting this different kind of effect. Ooh, I get to control what's on top of your deck. But it's very weak, and it's just wasting our time. Mm. Yes, that makes it makes sense. Some harsh words for Brian Pool. I mean, who, who if not you, right? You what, huh? Who if not you, to have harsh words about your cards? <laughs> 
Oh, lots of people. <laughs> I'm sure we can find a parade of people who are willing to say bad things about Scrying Bowl. <laughs> well, I'm not one of them. <laughs> sure. Mick always defends all these cards, like these powerful cards that really shape the game. Uh, and I mean, certainly, you know, the most important thing is how much fun we're having. And yeah. so, like, Observatory would have been a powerful card that would have shaped the game, and it would have been more fun because we wouldn't have had to stop and deal with all this spy. Hmm. All right, let's, let's move on. This is not Trail, this is Sheepdog. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for tuning in. You can find me on Discord for feedback. I am at Strumpf. And I'll catch you all next time. The game has ended. Bye!